Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Monday, January 10th. Derek Van Riper here with Eno Saris. On this episode, we will discuss a wide variety of questions. A lot of good questions came in to the mailbag. Questions about multi-position players and whether they might be underrated. I think Eno has um, the opposite feeling, so we'll discuss why he feels that way and figure out <coughs> maybe on both sides of the argument, depending on where in the player pool exactly you're looking. Uh, Brandon Lau, very popular in the mailbag this weekend, so we'll talk about him on this episode. Uh, we'll talk about what to do when you see a partial season of war. Is it something that you should, if you have a third of a season, multiply by three and say, hey, that's about what that player would have done, or is it more complicated than that? Uh, some questions about dollar values, if we get that far, uh, where to play in leagues, how to increase activity in dynasty leagues. So yeah, lots of ground to cover. We'll cover some, maybe all of it, but at least some of it on this episode you know how was your weekend it was good until you absolutely murdered me in pickleball oh my god well it's your white first time playing with me <laughs> it was the first took time me like three game. games to score a point <laughs> <laughs> it's it's okay like it, i i think that's that's normal i had about a two-year head start <laughs> it was fun uh and we we had a little toast to celebrate uh the sale and um yeah it was it was it was a decent weekend yeah i saw sing two mm. uh, which uh, you know for me is weird because i i really uh do not i'm like i'm not a broadway guy i do not like musicals uh generally and even musicals in the past that have had like pop songs in them i don't like but i love sing it's it's um something about doing it with animated guys and just having like an animated wolf uh you know doing a, a, a prince song it's something it's something so weird about it and it also reminded me you know i didn't really know the words to um uh billy jean is not my lover until i heard a greek cover of it by someone who spoke all the words you know very differently than michael jackson and i was like Oh, the kid is not my son. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Oh my God. So there were a few lines in uh, the Prince cover that I was like, oh, I didn't know. There's a thing about eggplant in here. So anyway, <laughs> and it's, it's like slightly uncomfortable to, to like realize these super sexual lyrics in this Prince song, uh, you know, it's being paraded around before you're, you know, seven and nine year old by, you know, these animated animals. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess that's the challenge of making content that parents will also enjoy is you have to be able to sneak things in that the kids don't pick up on and not ask a lot of questions about. So, yeah, my wife has a, my wife and I have a big disagreement about that where I judge, uh, I judge uh, movies based on whether or not I like them, you know, like kids' movies, even. She's like, not that for you. And I'm like, yeah, but I have to sit there. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Might as well make it enjoyable for me, too. <laughs> I mean, I think some of the best examples I can think of, and I say this as someone who doesn't have any kids, I, I would think of like Shrek as a, a pretty good movie mm. that I feel like when, when that came out, you watch that and you're like, I think everybody could like this. I think kids like it. I think grownups like it. I think teenagers yeah, like it. Enough you know. adult jokes in there for sure. Yeah. And I just think that's the, that's almost the hardest thing to do is to make something for everyone. Toy Story was probably like that. I mean, clearly made for kids, but also mm -hmm. made well enough where everybody can sit there and enjoy it. I know they made like 10 more Toy Stories. So I'm sure <laughs> Toy Story 7, you know, Andy moves into the retirement home is, is not <laughs> as enjoyable as the original was, but you know, you got to keep the franchise going. I, you get I a little dark that. on that one. Maybe <laughs> these are his rehabilitation toys. Now well, I know he's, he's still, I mean, he still has Woody and buzz with him. They're you have toys. You put them on your shelf. Andy had it, toy story Four. Andy hosts a baseball podcast I mean, like, <laughs> and they're on the shelf behind him. Like, what? You just keep it going. Like it's it's part of life. I, I, there you go. All right. Well, we'll go to the baseball now. No one. Yeah, right. uh, what I was up to this weekend. Actually, no, I actually started cleaning my apartment. Like not in a like light spring cleaning sort of way. But just like moving things to where they actually should go. So it feels like, you know, 
we're not packing up in a few months and leaving again because we're not packing up in a few months and leaving again. <laughs> or if we are, I don't know that yet. And I will be <laughs> very, very upset when I find that out at some point. Uh, so moving on to the baseball, the uh, question that we we're going to start with today, are multi-position players underrated? This question came in from Mitch. He writes, I had an observation as I was starting up draft season with the large roster size of NFBC's draft and hold format, which for those who haven't played it yet or haven't heard us talk about it yet, that's a 50-round format. Some of those leagues are 12 teams, some are 15, deep nonetheless, no in-season pickups. It seems to me that the multi-position eligible players, especially those that provide both speed and power, are being severely undervalued. So the examples he threw at us include Jake Cronenworth, first, second, short, middle corner. Uh, Enrique Hernandez, second outfield and middle. Chris Bryant, third and outfield. Mark Canha, first and outfield. And I think, you know, relative <laughs> price, of course, is something to consider here. Like Chris Bryant's kind of just inside the top 100 in terms of ADP. Cronenworth goes about 25 picks after that. Uh, and then you've got Kike and Canha, both go outside the top 200 in most drafts. So a good mix of different guys. You were saying before we started, though, that you think that multi position players might be slightly overvalued in these formats so i guess i want to start by asking you why do you think they might be slightly overvalued well i think they're certainly overvalued in a situation where you have a waiver wire uh because uh you don't need to have backups for all your positions those are the guys on the waiver wire you know <laughs> like if that's just what you're gonna have to do is go to the waiver wire to get replacements uh in teams in, in setups like these uh, draft champions where you don't have a waiver wire best ball, then they do. They are very important. I'm not saying they're not important. I'm just saying that um, it just seems in practice that I haven't quite found uh, the balance between wanting those on my team and, and wanting to have uh, three or four uh, players at every position, which requires uh, some multi eligibility guys and uh, how much I want to spend on that. Uh, so for an example, uh, I just picked, uh gene segura am i saying that correctly yep um with uh i can actually in real time uh check out what pick that was uh, i think it was pick 202 sounds uh, about right yeah i picked him with pick 202 uh by the auction calculator he is a ten dollar player but he has a single eligibility um jake cronenworth went ahead of him uh he has but I'm not saying that 9.6 on the auction calculator is inferior to 10.3. I'm just saying that Jake Cronenworth went like four rounds before. Um, and John and Segura was still there uh, at, at $10. Um, Enrique went before him. Uh, Ryan McMahon went before him and is worth uh, by the auction calculator $3 less. Uh, Chris Taylor, I think Luis Urias even went. Luis Urias is evaluated by the auction calculator at $5. So I got a value on Segura just because he didn't have any other positional eligibilities and people were reaching for that. Now, it's, it's a question I, I put to you this, this very weekend at the pickleball yeah. was how much in dollars uh, do you think that eligibility is worth? Um, and you had I've got a guess. That number. I have that number at about two for a draft and hold. It's a plus two dollars to the value when you can't make those in season moves closer to probably just an even dollar if you can get those replacements. I think where you 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 can save quite a bit in NFBC specifically, and, and some leagues are full on weekly leagues. NFBC, you get twice weekly changes for your hitters, only once weekly changes for your pitchers. Having more flexibility on the roster does reduce the amount of playing time you lose at the midweek change, right? So if you have more multi-position guys and you lose a third baseman, but you can shuffle mm. around and actually get someone who's going to play a lot in because you have that flexibility, you're getting more playing time, more production than you would if you didn't have that flexibility. It, it's value on the margins, but I do think in draft and hold, when you can't go to the wire and make a move at all, it's a bigger thing to look for. It's even more important to have some, some guys that can move around uh, because you're going to lose players. You're going to have injured guys that come back you're gonna have some injured guys that don't come back you're gonna have guys that get sent down inevitably your roster is going to get smaller over the course of the season and one way to protect yourself against that is just to have as many options as you can who can fill uh, multiple spots so i actually think it sort of depends on who the player is and uh, with this and this is mentioned in mitch's email you have to consider too 
how much playing time risk comes with this profile? Because one thing you were saying when we were talking about this over the weekend was a lot of the guys that pick up multi-position eligibility are not necessarily stable ding, hitters. Ding, right? ding, ding. Or not the stars. The stars, you know, I mean, Tatis, but... And, and maybe Bryant uh, are the top end guys, but you know most of the guys you, they just put you out of position. They want you there. You're the star. Yeah. So I think you have almost, almost to ask yourself why did this guy get multiple positions last year? If the answer was well, someone got hurt and they were the best option to play the other position, then that might actually be you know, more of a stable multi position guy for the current year in terms of his playing time going forward. Um, but it also might mean that in like at a keeper league, he's not going to retain multi-position eligibility. His job is not to move around. It just was <laughs> in that one unique circumstance. Whereas you know, an example of that, you know, I would say maybe is it's not Cronenworth. It's probably more like a DJ LeMahieu in that case. So he had a spot to call his own. They had injury issues that moved him around. So he picked mm-hmm. up first, second, and third. We don't expect DJ LeMahieu to move around quite as much this year. He could still do it if he needs to, but he's probably tracking more towards the one spot is his in the future. Again, doesn't matter for 2022, uh, but he wouldn't have that same sort of playing time risk. Whereas if you start going further down the pool and he even, and I would say at the high end, Kike Hernandez is an example of this. Maybe Josh Rojas is a good example of this. Just going about 10 picks later, he's second short and outfield is Josh Rojas versatile and, and like in a good way, or is he just versatile in a way where he can, collect extra is playing time until someone else is there yeah, yeah right would he be supplanted and made more of a utility guy if all their prospects hit or come up and you know but i think this is actually has a real life corollary because you know there was some research uh done by a, a former uh, leader of the uh analytics department in in in, in los angeles who said that you know Chris Taylor is worth an extra win or two beyond his production on the field because he can play all over. Right. And if you look at the way the Dodgers have been built uh, and now the giants, you know, with Farhan leaving the Dodgers, um, I think it's pretty obvious that they really value positional versatility and having sort of backups on the roster in this way that you're talking about where, uh, oh, you know, it's Tuesday and uh, someone's got a barking ha- hamstring. Can we just move this guy here and move this guy here? Oh, yeah, we can, because that's how we're built. Um, and that's how you keep your that's that that is valuable. However. You know, you'd also want to do that with stars. And I wonder if and you also want them to be undervalued. Like you want to be getting a value out of it. So you want to sign, I think like a Tommy Lastello who can play first and second, right? Not that well, but like you want, you want that versatility. You want to sign these guys that are cheap and provide you versatility. But do you want to buy Chris Taylor at the top of the market and pay him a lot to do this? Because he's no longer a good option at shortstop. You know? You don't really want to play him at shortstop defensively. So now he's pretty much an outfielder who can play second or short in a pinch. Right. Right. He's lost his versatility because he's older and he's more established. And yes, he can be a starter in center field. That's fine. Uh, Or in, in, in the outfield. That's fine. But versatility, I think, is the domain of young, unproven you know, guys coming up rather than something I would rat- want to pay for on the free agent market. And that's where the real life and the fantasy, I think, correlate, which is what I'm trying to say is, yes, I love def- uh, positional versatility. No, I don't want to pay for it. I want it. I want it to be undervalued. I don't want to pay full price for it. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, and, and, and then the last bit is you'll see, even if you just run the auction calculator, uh, and put a position that nearer to the bottom of the auction calculator, there will be a lot of guys that, like we said, that play all over. Uh, so, it, you know, even in my league, Eduardo Escobar is still out there. Luis Arise is still out there. Jonathan Scope is still out there. Um, you know, these are all guys that have multiple uh, position eligibility that, you know, I can still use to paper over uh, and get some plate appearances if other guys are hurt. 
but won't be starters for me. I'm not paying starter money and I'm not overpaying what the auction calculator says. You know, I'll go get them in the $3 rounds. I'll pay $3 and they might actually be worth $5 because they have all those positional eligibilities. That's what I want. I want to get the, I want to get that undervalued. I don't want to pay for it is what I'm saying. So I think at this point, Cronenworth is going at the very sort of height of his cost. Like I, I think he's going among the starters in a way that I'm not sure I do have a team, a DC team with, with Cronenworth on it, but I'm just not sure that you want to target it hardcore. Like this team right now that I've built, I have not thought about uh, positional versatility at all. And uh, you know, I've got Walsh, Rogers, Torres, Devers, Segura, Betts, and O'Neill. Um, I think only Torres and Rogers have will have multiple eligibility this year. But I totally plan on having more multiple eligibility guys. Right. You know what I mean? I just didn't want to pay at the top in the top rounds in the top of the market. Well, you'll find a few that pick it up in season though too like labor torres uh, should be doesn't have it yet short and second pretty mm -hmm. soon after the season begins assuming that the yankees find their upgrade at shortstop via free agency or trade and even right? maybe even if not even if Ur urshela come can play some shortstop sometimes you know it mm -hmm. just takes 10 games yeah so uh, i would say the most undervalued multi-position eligible players are the players who will add that value early in the season and not cost and, oh yeah or yeah don't even they don't even show up as having it yet but even when you start looking at a team like the giants which lean into the versatility of a lot of players and, and like where do the players they have or had last year where do they go in terms of adp bryant's of course among them with that third outfield i think bryant bryant's undervalued because of previous shoulder issues and maybe because people don't know where he's going to play in 2022 since he didn't sign yet like that's that to me is why he's underrated. It's not necessarily because people aren't valuing third and outfield enough. It's because of uncertainty about home park. Lamont Wade kind of goes in the back of the top 300. I think there's playing time uncertainty I love there. That one 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 B O F is 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 really undervalued. I've noticed. Yeah, yeah, and that I, gives I, you C I and and C I and one B are and first base are actually kind of hard in some of these drafts. And at it, least but really Wade, back end first basemen are not really that exciting here's the thing too like if you look at wade versus even wilmer flores who's first second and third flores goes like 100 picks later he's very draftable especially in these these formats where you, know, you can't make in-season pickups wade being a lefty and flores being a righty like even if you're looking at part-time playing time shares like there's to me a, a better path for wade to get 75 to 80 percent of a job whereas flores seems like he's kind of more likely to top out at that range, like it doesn't, it doesn't you're, you're like waiting for an, playing time for Flores is happening. You're waiting for a significant injury on that Giants infield before you're playing Flores in a weekly league, right? And you might shuttle him in for a weekend or a partial week, depending on what's going on with the rest of your roster, and say, Well, he's probably going to play three times in these four days because they're going to see Coors, two lefties, lefties and yeah, or something, yeah, stuff like that. But I do think the identity of those part time players, like what they bring, what drives their playing time left-handed right-handed is a kind of a big part of which ones I'm interested in taking the chances on. Yeah. And some, some combinations are worth more than others. Like perhaps the, the combinations I have are worth less than others. In, in, the multi eligibilities I have are both uh, second and short. So uh, maybe that's actually not that valuable because you're not, you're just staying in the middle infield and it's a pretty common, maybe multi eligibility to have um, as players kind of age out of shortstop. A lot of them go to second, so there's a lot of sort of second and short, and uh, and it also can be kind of weird. Like, when am I going to when am I going to switch those guys around? You know, they're my starters. Yeah. The question I have for you about Jake Cronenworth, I I, I feel like that ADP is a little high, one twenty four point eight from the email. I mean, I'm looking at just drafts from January. I can't imagine he's going much earlier or later than that he kind of goes to the same spot all the time yeah 116 is where he's going in the handful of drafts that have been done so far this month for me it's not that people are are paying up extra because he can go corner middle with first second and short i think people are maybe just higher on his skills than i am as a hitter hmm. and i definitely underestimated how much he was going to play last year i don't want to overcorrect and then overestimate how much he's going to play this year 
I like that he doesn't strike out a lot, but he's a little older than you'd think for a guy that hasn't been in the big leagues that long. What am I what am I missing in his profile? In last year, he popped 21 homers. Is there another level power-wise? The run production could be a little better, possibly. Right? 94 runs scored against 71 RBIs. Probably not going to move in the order all that often, though. I mean, I, I just think a lot of what he did last year was closer to his max. Since he does move around, he doesn't necessarily have a spot to call his own. I think he's a good player, but I don't see another level there. Yeah, I mean, the barrel rate doesn't suggest it. 7% barrel rate suggests that uh, he kind of over overproduced on his barrels a little bit. Uh, the projections uh, are okay, but 16 homers, six stolen bases, 269. I mean, you're, you're, uh, the Segura uh, projections are better. I mean, that's why Segura is worth more. But to be able to move that around, I could see Cronenworth being worth more. But, you know, the difference in our draft was Cronenworth 120, Segura 200. Yeah, not worth 80 picks. And they seem like worth very something. similar players. So the guys that will have a good batting average pop, you know, 15 to 20 homers. Segura is going to steal more bases and has demonstrated a longer track record, a good batting average. But otherwise, they're very comparable players just on that on that bit. I mean, even just the, the Kike Hernandez difference, too. Like, I, I know they're slightly different, just Kike is older, but. Is Cronenworth that much better than Kike to justify a 100-pick difference? I don't think so. Yeah. And it's unfortunate because I really like Cronenworth. And as a real-life player, I think he's he's going to be really hugely important to the Padres next year. But he just sort of represents, uh, I think, the high watermark for the, you know, the, the multi-position where people are maybe considering that too much, you know. I'm just saying, you know, I'm just saying like there are many opportunities to get multi-position guys. You don't necessarily have to think about it in the first six to eight rounds. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like there's lots of them coming later. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's a, a good way to sum it up. But I appreciate that question, Mitch. I think it's definitely something to think about. And without moves, the deeper the league, I think you do want to think a little more about that as you kind of build out the middle core of the roster at the very least. There are some early rounders that carry multi-position eligibility too so if you get them along the way terrific if you don't it's not going to ruin your team yeah that's what i'm that's basically what i'm saying and you'll find some values by looking at guys who only have one position like the segura situation segura is like sort of comically undervalued year to year but the the other thing i just wanted to say real quick uh, was that i do think it is useful to get to the number four at every position and the only way to do that, given the roster constraints, is multi-position guys, if you think about it. You can't actually draft four at every position and eight catchers and, you know, you can't do that. So you kind of have to find uh, multi-position guys to, to make it work. Yeah, that's definitely a good point, too. Let's go to our next question. This one came in from Royce, who points out that he's from the same hometown as Braylon Allen. So if you are a fan of Wisconsin football uh, like me. That means something to you if you are not a fan <laughs> of Wisconsin football. It's Greek. Yeah, you're like, who's Braylon Allen? Uh, <laughs> moving on to the question, can you break down Brandon Lau on the pot? He had 39 bombs last year, but his path to it seems interesting. Both his strikeout rate and walk rate went down as the year progressed, and his production seemed to skyrocket. Was he being more aggressive early? It all seemed to change around the end of July, which also seems to coincide with when Nelson Cruz arrived, a guy that hits his pitch when he sees it. I can't figure out a good fan graph, splits tool, or savant search function to see if a player is being aggressive earlier in counts. So you took a look. What did you find looking at Brandon Lau's approach as the 2021 season rolled along? I mean, he definitely was less aggressive Uh in the second half, what I see is uh, I just used the graph tool and looked at his swing and, OS and his reach rates on fan graphs, the day that you can do uh, 15 game rolling graphs uh, on fan graphs. And um, the strangest thing happened right around that time that they pointed out the end of July, they say end of June, end of July, end of July. Yeah. Um, he just stopped reaching at pitches. He, he swung a lot less in general. And I think what you're seeing is here's a guy who was struggling a little bit. And he said, you know what, when I'm struggling, a good thing for me to do sometimes is just to wait for my pitch and just like really just be get aggressively patient, you know? And so there's this like big uh, tank in his, in his reach rate. And then his, uh, 
his uh, Wobo comes back up and, and he has that excellent second half. The weird thing is that he goes back to reaching like he did at the beginning of the season. <laughs> By the end of the season, everything is back to normal. Um, so I, I don't think that we saw something change in Brandon Lau that will be changed for the rest of time. You know what I mean? I think that he... It was just one of those cat and mouse things over the course of a season where there was some book on him that was working and then say he said, screw it. And one thing that you see is a slider slider rate went from 20 percent to like 10 percent uh, during that time. So I think uh, if uh, what I'm seeing is he said, I'm not going to swing at any sliders. <laughs> you know? And the, the sliders he got that he still got, you know, were sliders in the zone. And that's why he got fewer sliders. Um, and after a while he realized, okay, well, I'm going to have to swing at some of these sliders cause they're in the zone and I, I don't want to just give up strikes. So that's the story I would tell is that he had a kind of a cat and mouse situation where he got boxed in a corner. He said, all right, I'm gonna spit at everything you throw at me for a while. And then he sort of figured his way out of the box. And, uh, the only thing I would say, add on top of that is I just think that he's undervalued, um, by the community, uh, you know, a guy who almost hit 40 homers last year, or he did, if you you know, count the postseason. Uh, he had such a poor postseason after all that um, that I think, you know, do I have that right? It definitely happened in the shortened season. I remember he had a struggling. zero, zero, zero postseason. Yeah. He did not get a single hit and struck out 50% of the time. So I think that that's in people's memories. And then they think his high his strikeout rate was higher than it even was. Um, guys, he's, yeah, he's projected for 29% strikeout rate, but. He hits the ball really hard. He actually does steal some bases, and he's not a guy I don't think that's a risk for hitting 210 with that batted ball profile. So I think your risk is that he hits 230 with, you know, 30 homers and five steals, and, uh, you know, the positive, the the ceiling is, is much better than that. Yeah, we like the Rays lineup, so he's going to drive in plenty of runs. He's going to score plenty of runs. I, I think... In terms of his five category profile, it's a lot of Max Muncy. Like it's a, it's a mm -hmm. lot of that, and I think the other thing that with stands some out of the risk is, even of sitting against lefties if he if he gets worse. I mean, but Muncy has the same risk to some extent. Yeah, because I think, they have teams that move guys around, and and Muncy gets that on the infield. But I think with Lau, we've seen him play double digit games in the outfield in each of the full length seasons. He could add that eligibility. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially, I mean, with, you know, Wander crowding the infield, he's going to play short pretty much every day. I think I don't expect uh -huh. him to move around too much, but also they do going to play somewhere. The Rays do so much mixing and matching at so many positions that, uh, Lau, I think got pushed last year into pretty much full playing time just by the fact that they were mixing and matching at other places. Cause they mix and match at third. If you just think about like, like we do this sometimes when we start doing the previews for the season, right? We do the, the build a roster and we, you know, like who are there, who are there, uh, there's probably like 14 bats, mm -hmm. you know, 13 bats, who are there 13 bats? And we always like try to be like, okay, these, so if you have 13 bats, right. And eight are on the field at any given time, that means that you can, and you, and you always need to have a backup catcher, right? Yep. So you got. Your eight starting bats, you have your backup catcher, that's nine. So you can have three to four more bats. That means by nature of it that you could platoon at three to four spots. And you'd actually want to have a bat on the bench at all times, right? So it's someone that can actually do like something. Yeah. Some lefty righty ability on the bench in terms of pinch hitting. So I would say that the max that a team can really platoon is three positions. So for the Rays, that's third, first. And to some extent, center. I think center. I would count center as their third one. And then just because of all the moving pieces, you know. You can move guys around and stuff. Yeah, but in terms of like a like a strict platoon that I have two guys assigned to this one position, I think three is around the max. Yeah, I think that's that's reasonable. That's why there's like extra position eligibility guys do become really valuable if you think about it, you know, like, you know, especially if they're like a lefty swinger, I feel like. Yeah, or, or if they're not, not in danger of losing time. Like that's the thing you have to be most careful right. with. I think when you look at the multi-position guys, I guess, is there some of that with Lyle then? I, I was thinking about it in the sense of what if walls becomes the, the full-time third baseman, they have so many, 
players that they can bring up because Vidal Brujan has nothing left to prove in the minors. So he's got to be and at least getting a chance. And base. He can play second base. That's probably the best place to play him. You've already played Lau in the outfield some, so you feel better about playing Lau in the outfield. Plus, you have Josh Lowe. So, you know, there, there's like, there's that. Like, he's going to play center because they're going to get rid of Kiermaier somehow. They have to. Like Kev- Kevin Kiermaier can't still be on this roster as a starter. He could be... To anybody that tells and asks me, you know, can the Padres move Eric Hosmer, I'll say the Rays have been trying to move Kevin Kiermaier for a while. <laughs> and there's a lot less, they, they uh, a lot less time money left on, on that field. Yeah, <laughs> money and time now at the point where I think you can find a taker for Kevin Kiermaier. So I just think it gets more crowded with young guys that they're going to want to play. As a result, I just think Brandon Lau ends up playing more in the outfield. So I don't think there's, I don't think there's that much playing time risk. I think his playing time risk would be missing time against lefties. Yeah. Because if you if you platoon three and a half spots, or if it just all works out in a way where you don't have to to play him as much against lefties, that's where he could lose a little bit. But he does a ton of damage when he connects. The K rate is not off the charts bad. Yeah, he, he could also be. be traded because they they all always trade their guys that get more expensive. So if he gets traded, uh, I think it would actually be brought positive for him most likely because he would be traded into a starting position where he doesn't really have any playing time risk probably, and he would also um, uh, leave the trot. So, so I, I I yeah I think he's a very good player. Uh, I don't know that you know he struck out twenty one percent of the time in the second half. I'm not. I'm not uh, expecting or hoping for that sort of a deal next year. No, but I can live with his mid twenties K rate because of how often he barrels up the ball. Like that's yeah. a perfectly fine trade off, even though you know you're probably sitting more in that 240, 250 range with the average uh, in a typical year. Uh, by the way, if you got a question for a future episode, email rates and barrels at theathletic.com, or you can ask in the comment section under this video on YouTube if you're watching there. We really appreciate it if you drop some questions in there because we'd like to defeat the algorithm. Trying to beat all the <laughs> algorithms in our lives. And that's one way for you to help us do that. So feel free to drop questions in there. I'll be sure to check in on that and make sure we get those questions in. Uh, another question here about the partial season of war and what to do with it. And the example that Kevin used in the email was for Glenn Otto. I don't know if anyone out here remembers Glenn Otto made six starts for the Rangers in the second half. He had a 25.2% K rate, not bad. 7.2% walk rate, okay, we can live with that. A 926 ERA, uh, but a 317 FIP, and that turned into a 0.6 war. So the question was, if he'd made 30 starts and pitched to the same skills, can I assume his war would have been 30 divided by 6 and just multiply that uh, that number and get to like a 3 war? Like, Is that a... Uh, actual way to get to the partial season of war, taking the optimal games divided by games and multiplying by war. Yeah. Unfortunately, this is actually, uh, I think a problem with, with war uh, uh, a problem. I don't, it's not, it's a problem with the way war is perceived, I think, which is that it's a counting stat and it, it racks up like RBI, except that it's not really a counting stat. It is in that it, gives you a one number at the end of the year, but you can put up negative mm-hmm. war. <laughs> so mm-hmm. uh, you can't put up negative RBI. <laughs> you, can't, you can't like unhit a homer. So, uh, <laughs> so even though war shows up in that same, like, oh, he put up three war, it's not the same as hitting three homers. And so, you know, that there is a, there is a sort of flaw in the way that war can be perceived that uh, gets exacerbated when people are like, oh yeah, he did, one win and a half season. So he's a two win guy. I don't have a great answer for you because I would say I definitely don't do the multiplication thing. Um, the one thing that does occur to me is that you could use uh, projections to kind of uh, fill it out. So we were talking about auto here. Yep. Uh, so auto through because uh, projections are uh, the numbers best estimate of the true talent of the player, right? So, um, you know, last year he put up uh, 0.6 war in 23 innings. He's projected for one war in 97. Um, you know, if you want to add those together and get an idea of what he might do in a, in a full sort of 120, 130 inning season, um, I, I'd feel better about that than sort of multiplying it. So. Ends up being 
uh, a pretty different answer, right? And so he ends up being a below average uh, starting pitcher with that uh, math. Yeah, because the projection with the playing time on fan graphs right now is 18 starts for 2022, 97 innings makes him a one war value, a uh, lower K rate, similar walk rate, higher home run rate. Uh, Babbitt kind of comes back into the stratosphere. He, there was a 423 Babbitt for Glenn Otto in those limited starts last year. So, yeah, that that seems a little weird, but um, it does give you a better a better indicator of what he'd be likely to do. I think that makes him more like a 1.6, 1.7 WAR pitcher if you kind of took that projection and added volume to it without changing skills. And it also helps you. Like you'll you'll if you think if you remember this, you know, in season, it really it really helps mostly in season because you'll see what the guy's done to date, and then there'll be a rest of season projection, right? And so you'll often see a guy who came out to a hot start, have two wins and the rest of season projections for half a win or something that helps you kind of realize, Oh yeah, I'm not going to double the two wins. I'm going to, I'm going to just uh, consider him a little bit better than, than a halftime player or something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it it really makes sense when you see the rest of season projections that should come together in terms of uh, what my model, I always, I'm so addicted to my model. I had to go look. Uh, It says that Otto has a plus slider, a really, really good slider a good knuckle curve so he's a two good breaking ball guy and that the four seam fastball uh if he locates a little bit better this year or has a little bit better stuff on it could be an average pitch so um you know i like auto it's two two breaking balls and, a, and an average fastball in a in a good location uh should be actually an above average pitcher so I, I auto is, you know, war aside, auto is somebody that I'd be interested in. Yeah, I think he's the kind of guy that once you get to that round 40 to 50 range of these draft and hold leagues we've been talking about, there could be a lot of innings there, too. And sometimes mm-hmm. just getting some innings from those picks late can be valuable, kind of spot them in carefully. Uh, one thing I was talking about last season after we had, I think it was Vlad Sedler was the guest on the Athletic Fantasy Baseball podcast that the AL West was a really favorable spot for pitchers a year ago. I think it's still going to be pretty good. Obviously, the Rangers are better with Seager and Marcus Simeon there, but if you are a Ranger, you're not pitching against the Rangers anyway, so uh, generally a division that I think is above average in terms of ease of matchups for pitchers, so keep that in mind too. Texas might be a little more streamable in our deep leagues than we are accustomed to with some of these young guys that they're trying to break in. Thanks a lot for that question, Kevin. Got a question about dollar values here from Charlie. He writes, I have kind of a beginner or big picture question. I'm only looking for a general response, maybe using a few players as examples. Heading into year two of an auto new league, but still feel pretty anchorless when judging dollar values for player production. Where do strong fantasy managers get a dollar value? Is there a rule of thumb on a stat or set of stats that we can convert into dollars? Or if we have to rank them on projections and inflate the best players for scarcity, how do we value scarcity? Simple math based on war, maybe. I get why Acuna is 50 to $60 and Guillermo Heredia is $1, but it seems like I could lose by being off by a few dollars on multiple $20 to $30 players. Thank you, Charlie. So even if you don't play auto new, I don't, I don't think this is specific to auto new. It's just inflation is a bigger issue there than it is in a lot of other leagues because there's a keeper aspect to it. It's just kind of the way that salaries and arbitration and things work in that format so let's go to the first part of the question where do you like to get your dollar values you know what do do you like to have factored into those well i like i use the auction calculator on fan graphs and um they've got some helpful presets there for auto new where you can just click one button and it, it sets up all the the rules and the dollars uh to to make it work um so that i that's a, I th- and like i said in in the last podcast i you know that we did on on fancy stuff i there is a bit of false precision uh in projections and in, in auction calculators so usually it's a guide for me uh even on that dollar level i know that there's uh, some analysts and some auto new players out there and who will just look at uh, the difference between the price of the player and uh the auction value and just cut them if if they don't uh I, I know some that want to even get, uh, you know, 30% more, you know, uh, value back than, than the auction calculator says and cuts everybody otherwise. However, I found that a lot of times the uh, auctions, the, the, the kind of restocking auctions in auto new and, and the draft, um, 
in, in you know the restocking drafts, the restocking part of any keeper league um, is overvalued. I find that uh, people are too excited to get uh, high picks for their players. I'd rather have the player than the pick most of the time. Uh, when I see trades like that, I think that the uh, the draft is often full of you know players that were rejected from other teams. <laughs> and you know a lot of times you, you be like oh well they just need to bounce back and like you know cody bellinger he's going to be out there and i want to have some money so i can go get him sure but there are also a lot of people who never bounce back you know right. so you're 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 buying from a pool of players that may have uh injuries that have changed the rest of the trajectory of their career you know may not have their fastball anymore you know may not you know there's you're buying from the the less desirable pool, you know, you're desi you're buying from the rejects. So like, you know, I, I just feel like um, I, I am a little bit closer to like, if it's worth uh, close to the value and then I'll go a little bit over. And that's the part where we start talking about inflation and the way that I, I have not found a really good way of doing it. Um, I believe the auction calculator has some sort of ability to kind of take players out of the pool uh, for the values. You can put there's like a little keeper thing where you can just like put players in there and that sort of takes them out and does some inflation work for you but the way i do it is just by eyeballing it. and what i do is as the draft approaches and as the keeper deadline approaches i keep looking at the free agent wire at each position and so i'll say okay i've got this first baseman i've got jose breu and i've got him for 21 dollars, and the auction calculator says he's worth 18 or 19. I could cut him, you know, and then maybe even try to buy him back at less. <laughs> what I find also is when you do something like that, you, Jose Abreu goes for 24 in the draft. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, so I would then be looking at the available first baseman on the free agent wire before I cut Abreu, just seeing like, what happens if I cut Abreu, he goes for 24 and I have to go for the second best option. That's inflation to me is What's the second best option? What's the third best option? What other options do I have at that position if I don't get that guy? And well, then, you're you're doing the homework to figure out what you think the room is going to do that's unique to the situation of there not being any other players league. like that. So and unique to your league, yeah. Because the the system does not know which first basemen are being thrown back when you run the dollar values. You're just exactly. looking at them kind of all. If everyone were available, this is what they'd cost. But you do have to make the human sort of uh, logical calculations and factor in the opportunity cost of, well, if I throw him back and he gets inflated above my price, then what do I do? Oh, crap. Now I've got Brandon Belt as the best first base option available or whatever it might be. Like, it, it's just that that should actually be a big part of your your final decisions. It shouldn't just be a pure raw dollar sort of calculation that you're using to decide whether or not you're keeping a player. I think the the other part of this question that's kind of interesting for me how precise do you need to be with your dollar values? And I, I mean, I use dollar values for leagues that are just snake drafts just to know, am I getting more here with this guy or this guy? Should I wait? You know, how, how much of a gap is there based on the projections and the things we care about? I'm still looking across positions, still looking for tier drops, looking for categorical drops as well. But how important do you think it is to be precise to the dollar on players? Is that is that where you're at the dollar level? Or do you think even that might be more precise than necessary given just given all the volatility and the noise that we're we're dealing with in, in the player pool in the, in the mostly in the form of injuries demotions all these different things that that throw chaos into our world like the projections themselves are are strong and, and accurate but we also know that there are some limitations too yeah yeah i mean um uh was the the r squared you know like I wish I, I should have done this before we got on here. I didn't think to do this, but you know the, what the tests uh, for for um, the, the the amount of error in projection systems. You know that you'll be surprised that there is a fair amount of error. You know, um, uh, and people don't do these as much as they should. I feel like, um, but the 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 amount of error here. Uh, here's here's something I found for evaluating the projection systems uh, on get big board. Um, the R squared between uh, uh, projections and outcomes uh, for each of the categories, the fantasy categories that we look at uh, is 
below 0.5. Hmm. So, uh, so less than a coin flip. Less, you know, than and those are the leaders. And those are that's steamer and ATC, you know. So that's 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 just how this uh, this was done. Um, uh, and of course, if we're all using projections and using the best projections, then then you've got to leg up on somebody. But uh, my point is that there's uh, still a bit of a coin flip situation here when we're talking about all the chaos and everything. Uh, that's why I think that uh, one of the things that Jeff Zimmerman does so well is, you know, his his motto is playing time is king. And um, I think that's I think that I think he's right. And I think it's because there's so much noise in projecting performance and performance, of course, is tied to playing time. But if you pick players in good playing time situations that are that are, you know, assured of playing time even if they don't hit their you know 90th percentile outcome in in terms of production then you're going to do better than other people that are always chasing this 90th percentile in terms of production right oh of course <laughs> or, yeah you know so so you know i guess my answer is i i use projections because that's what we have and that's what we we need to have an, a, a mooring we need to have an anchor but i will go a dollar or two or three above or under whatever i will and i will try to read the room you know, Segura at ten dollars was was uh, was a good pick after one twenty. After if Joe Cronenworth is going to go at one twenty, right? So I've been sitting there looking at Segura for like eight rounds, there's <laughs> eight eighty picks. You know, so like uh, I, I feel like uh, I I could have I could have taken him two or three rounds ago. So you you have to think about the room. You have to think about the specifics of each position, the inflation at each position. Uh, you have to think about uh, their, their age and the, your your team's win cycle. And if you want to pay more for a, a win now or if you're just trying to amass the young guys. Um, and then you really want to think about playing time above all else. And some of those things are in the projections. Some of those things the projections are good at. Some of the things they're not so good at. So uh, I think, you know, I'm willing to throw a human brain on top of those projections. I just like how it took me losing to Jeff directly in tout wars a handful of times before i had that revelation like i think it was sometime last draft season where i was like maybe the edge is projecting playing time and it's like yeah he's been telling people that for a while <laughs> yeah. so, like i, I like he literally I like, has a tweet like from yesterday this is the playing time is king yeah like I, and i think he's been pretty clear about that for a long time that that's how he plays and um, wow that's that's why he wins a lot and yeah. <laughs> It, but for for me, I think the the light bulb moment, even though it was spoon fed to all of us, was just thinking about it in the sense of everyone goes in with projections. Projections within a reasonable degree are are pretty similar across the board, or we're using the same two, three, four sets of projections in a room of fifteen people. So if we're all looking through the same kinds of evaluation lens for players, there's just not that much that's going to give us separation. I think just from a pure like leverage standpoint, going through and projecting playing time on my own having a different volume of playing time more accurate volume of playing time projected that to me seemed like the just a just a simple and way even different if, than the room and even if you're not going to go through that's like a pretty labor intensive uh, situation uh the the kind of low-hanging fruit the underlying uh low-hanging fruit there that is available to anybody with less work is where are their playing time battles where is their playing time to be lost and gained right and I, that's where, you know, I think there's a huge uh, number of val like I tell everybody, if I was if I wasn't if I was going to use somebody else's projections, I mean, this is part of my process is just to look through the depth charts every year. I look through the depth charts and I look at a backup. I look at the backup situations and it's what I do in basketball, too. I look at the backup situations and I look at, you know, who was already creeping forward, who was losing time. Josh Bell was starting to lose some time against lefties. What does that mean? You know, that sort of that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at. Who who's a young guy that could come up and and take that job? What like Taylor Walls? Like wh like who's he, is he going to take third? You know, is Andy Diaz going to be finally you know like pretty much on the outs, or is Walls going to be a halftime player? Like those are the playing time situations I think that are worth a lot because if you if you get that right, you get all those extra plate appearances. Yeah, I think in in mono leagues and draft and hold being right about who actually plays a lot off the bench ends up being big. And then of course, who wins those outright battles. That's huge for, for mixed leagues where, I mean, those, those, those are huge in mono leagues too, but I just think the line of at which you're looking for playing time to be 
above expectations, it really changes a lot based on the type of league you're playing. Yeah, and of course. Yeah. Very cap- Captain Obvious sort of uh, revelation there too. But uh, just passing that along, like what you're looking for, can can vary quite a bit depending on just how deep your league actually goes. Uh, thanks a lot for that question, Charlie. The other question about dollar values that came in came from Alan, and it's a auction with daily rosters and deep benches. He's just asking if player A is projected to play in 120 games and return $20 in value versus player B projected to play in 150 and return the same $20 in value. Is A more valuable because I can sub in a bench player for those extra 30 games, or is it no real value because the player I'm subbing in is basically a $1 player? If player A is more valuable, how much more valuable are they? I think player A is is more valuable than B based on the quality of player C. It, like the the question sort of answers itself, right? If you have mediocre bench guys, then the difference could end up being nothing. Or yeah. if you have a bad bench player, you could actually hurt yourself with player A, right? A daily league does give you that opportunity though to maximize the value of every lineup deadline. So you get twenty plus whatever you're able to get in the lineup on those days where that other player doesn't play which, you know, assuming injury or known lineup issues ahead of time where you can cycle players in and out, you can take advantage of that. Yeah, there's some question of uh, why uh, the playing time is lower, right? Uh, if it's because they're in a platoon situation, then you just need to have a platoon on your, on, your, on your roster. You know, you need to have another player on your roster that plays that position. So then he, the multi-eligibility guys really help um but uh if it's because he's going to be injured then you have to ask yourself how many il slots do i have and is this guy gonna likely to get injured and eat up my bench spot so i guess um you know one type is maybe josh donaldson there's a guy who's going to have a good projection for when he's in uh but he's going to lose random games to load management to you know the cranky calf or whatever it is and yeah. that's going to be oh. that's going to be harder if you're if you're thinking oh i'll replace that production from off the wire that's going to be harder to do right because he's going to lose single games here and there you know and then and you, are you, you going to have like a stream like are you going to have a streaming guy or do you have a guy that's third b eligible that's on your bench that you're like okay i have josh donaldson he's going to start but heimer candelario is is going to play for him on the days where his calf sucks yeah, then you've got a pretty good situation then you probably want the guy who is better in less playing time because you've got Heimer Candelario on your bench. So yeah, it depends on player C. It depends on player C. It depends on, you know, your IL situation. It depends on why that player has a a lower playing time projection. And I think the other key to all of this, I think Jeff Zerman would say it's the guy, you want the guy with the bigger playing time projection. (laughs) Well, I don't know if he'd say that necessarily because, again, we're looking back at it retroactively. So we know that the outcome is that the values are equal. And then it's just a question of making sure you have good players to replace him. Right. I right. Mean, like, right. The where it starts to break down, if you're in a weekly league where you can't get the injured player out. when, yes, when weekly, Josh Donaldson's for sure. When the cranky calf, which sounds like a either a, a dive bar or like a really like nice small plates kind of gastro pub situation. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you lose Donaldson on a entrance. Tuesday in a weekly league, then th- that's wasted production. You're not getting somebody in the lineup for that time. So I do think this is where your risk tolerance in a daily league changes slightly. Your bench isn't endless, though. You can only have so many part-time guys on the bench. You need some versatility. You need to be able to and get I pitchers use the in bench and out. Most for pitchers, yeah. <laughs> so right? I, so you, you can't like have just have guys all on my bench there. You can't have all the guys that are going to play 110 to 120 games that are undervalued all on the same roster, but you could definitely take advantage of that in in leagues like that. So it's a good question. But generally, I think even in the weekly leagues, Donaldson is uh, pretty uh, undervalued at this point. He's really dropping like a stone and he's available really late. And uh, I think even in a, in a keeper in a weekly league, if he wasn't my starter at a position and he was just the guy I could plug in or use at corner infield. Uh, that's sort of where he's starting to get drafted now. Uh, I'm back in on him. I just, it's hard to depend on him as a, every down back, uh, you know, as a starter at third base. I like when you, you get the football analysis. Uh, <laughs> I just don't have much in there. Use, use football <laughs> jargon. <laughs> 10 points. <laughs> well, I, all I have is that and like the Mike Shanahan of the bullpen. Well, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's just the raise, man. They've just been, <laughs> just being like the Rays. 
Uh, next question here came from Mark. Just a question about where to play. I mean, we talk about the NFBC a lot all the time. He's wondering if we could take some time to walk through different leagues, which are open to anyone to join and, and where you can learn more about them. He says his brother runs a co uh, co-manages a team with them, and they've had some commissioner shenanigans in recent years. So they're looking to join a league that won't break the bank, but is competitive because they also don't want to get waxed by fantasy pros. Any thoughts on something like this? We talk about the NFBC a lot on this show. Um, they don't pay us to do it. We just like playing their contests because they are very competitive. But I think the thing they have done really well in the last few years, is they've opened up more types of contests. You can get in at much lower price points, mm -hmm. right? So just a few different things. They have a they have a contest overview page, which you can check out. NFBC. It's a, it's a weird website. It's nfc.shgn.com if you want the actual URL. Just search NFBC, and I think it now appears ahead of the Niagara Frontier Bicycle Club or whatever <laughs> yes, that bicycle was that would come up. Made in my existence. <laughs> oh, come on. We should, we Every should time actually... I just write NFBC up in the URL, I'm like, what? I, I think <laughs> Greg and Tom should do like a charity bike ride with those guys to like <laughs> get them to just hand over the URL or something. There's yeah. got to be some way to, to make it all work, but that's, that's for them to, to sort out. But uh, there's all sorts of contests. I mean, I, I think my advice would be if you co-manage with someone, figure out what you're willing to spend on a league. I, I would say that even like a 12-team online championship league at the NFBC, it's 30 rounds, typical 14 hitters, nine pitchers, weekly fab, seven bench spots. That's not an unapproachable league. It's just a question of whether or not you want to put in that much of an entry fee. The entry fee is 350 I think, for the online championships. They have you know, some $100 leagues, though, don't they? What are the, what are the 100 and they, they have some for less than that, too. But I'm saying in terms of just the level of difficulty, those are those are challenging leagues, but they're not they're not overwhelming. Like if, if you play in a home league and you've done well you know, multiple years, I think you can be competitive in an online championship if you're able to stay on top of the twice weekly changes. If you take the time to like look at how the format plays, obviously there's no trading. So if mm -hmm. trading is part of the reason why you win your home leagues because you're better at trading than everybody else, okay, you got to factor that in. You're you're not going to be able to do that. In you need to like build this. more balanced squads. You can't. You can't just you know uh, uh, collect uh, you know a ton of talent and be like, oh, well, I have no steals. And I'll just trade them later. That doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, there, uh, there's there is a learning curve in these leagues because of the way people play them. But I I would say that's probably the higher end of the of where I would begin if I was making the leap from mm. never playing before to playing. I I don't think for most people you'd want to say let's just take a plunge let's just go for the main right away like that yeah yeah that seems pretty risky i would dabble in either like a satellite especially, league or you know something yeah. different before doing that yeah and especially because i mean and i don't begrudge anybody their business model I, you know and i'm not i'm not accusing them of anything untoward they you know they list everything that you can see all the, the return and what you what you can win and it's all there for you to figure out there is a, a fair amount of rake you know, uh, at NFPC, like they're going to, they take, it's not like you just add up all the entry fees and you get, you know, for first place, you get most of it. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, uh, they have to run a business. So, um, that's, uh, that can turn some people away. You know, they'd rather, uh, have a league where, you know, if you had 12 participants, they all put their money in and all the money goes to, you know, the winners. Um, and I understand that. However, there, you know, there aren't, uh, the forums that there used to be uh where we used to all go and post and find leagues um and it, i have uh, seen that it's difficult for people these days to get a league together with strangers um because there's just not these same gathering points right you know i know that i've they've asked us on twitter now um to do a post to to help uh, athletic readers find leagues so we can we can do that uh at some point where just kind of create a dummy post just to have people talk to each other about, you know, getting in leagues together. Um, but, uh, and one last a bit of warning is if you're doing those uh, leagues on the side, uh, be careful about PayPal. PayPal can actually freeze, uh, you know, your, your fundage. So if anybody is like sort of, uh, you know, sending in um, funds for the, the, the keeper league or for the whatever and says, this is for the fantasy league. Uh, it it can get frozen, you know. Like PayPal is uh, does not want to be in that business and uh, has frozen accounts in the past for stuff like that. So I would just say, 
uh, league safe is a, is a decent uh, alternative. If you're going to have a, a group of friends or even strangers, league safe uh, has some protections in there and is made for this. Uh, league safe is a way to kind of, um, and there is a little bit of a fee, but it's, 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 it's uh, a, a small one. Yeah. So the variety of leagues, though, I mean, we talk about NFBC 50s. Those are already running like crazy. Those are 12 team leagues. 50 bucks is the entry fee. 50 rounds, no in-season pickups. So that's different, too. If you want to do something with in-season pickups, the satellite leagues I was mentioning before, they do 12 teamers and 15 teamers in that format. They start those, I think, are five bucks. Those are good. I think that's where I would start the $125 satellite leagues because draft and hold and best ball are just a, a totally different animal. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're just not you're you're gonna be like in a new place and doing a new game where you're just and, and then you don't get any of the juice of of running that league during the season. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of those you know draft and hold is you just you draft it and you forget it basically. You check in on it every once in a while. So uh, or you do, or you set some lineups in certain set standings and that's it. So I would say the satellite league is the way to start if you're gonna try an FPC. The other thing you got to keep in mind too, you know, why why don't they pay back 100% of the prizes? There are licensing fees that you have to pay now to operate in states. That's a mm -hmm. significant cost. Stats cost a lot of money too. So. Legal fees. People that work on the website, they have to they have to be yeah. paid. I'm not I'm not begrudging it at all. I'm just saying that you know some people would rather play you know where 100% is going back to the winners. Right. I just think for some people they're like, where does that money go? Well, they're they're just overhead in running a contest like this. It's real like it's yeah. stats are stats are very like, expensive like coding like they have to they've, they've made a game for you the rooms are really good too i i find that the in-season play is very good because the fab is more intuitive than most it runs really quickly you know just lots of good it's, stuff it's, all it's around. a nicely put together site like it, it, it's a fun it's like yeah it's good and and uh if you're in a draft and you and you and you something happens like um we we were drafting steven kwan the outfielder for the uh, Indians, the Guardians, and uh, it was he was listed as a free agent, and so we were just like, "Is this the right Stephen Kwan?" Or like, why isn't he listed as being for Cleveland or whatever? And we alerted uh, support, and we got, I think it was like an hour or something. We got we got something right back. So their support is really good, and um, the players are they're good too because it's you know it's for money. The other sites that run leagues, I don't play any leagues where I pay money on fan tracks. I've done Tout Wars drafts in there. Uh, they they do run leagues. They have best ball stuff up right now. They've got a bunch of different formats up. They've been around for a while. RT Sports is another one. I, I would I would just say I've, I've used I've played in leagues on all three. Even though I only I think every league I've played on fan tracks and RT has been like a side league. There wasn't like a cash entry fee. The only ones I've had buy-ins for the last several years have been NFBC, and they're quick to pay out at the end of the year too. So you just that that's a nice little extra bit of security. You never know with uh, some of the other sites that I don't even know that are out there. If you go with something that's not reputable necessarily, and I'm not saying that fan tracks are RT, I'm saying other new sites that might be popping up. There's always that added risk that money might disappear. So just keep that in mind as well. So hopefully that gives you some idea. We keep talking about all these leagues. Hopefully that's at least um, a little bit of a breakdown. But just go to the contest overview page. You can see what the entry fees are. You can read more about the rules, what makes those leagues unique over at NFBC. That is going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. If you've got a question for a future episode, be sure to send those in. If you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to barrel up on the on the like button uh, on Twitter. He's at Eno Saris. I am at Derek Van Riper. We are back with you on Thursday. Thanks for